so there's an old story that was told. It was about when Jesus got back to heaven, how there was a party planned. Well, well first of all, there was a pool. And the winner of the pool was the date that Jesus returned to heaven. Oh, come on. You can't chuckle a little bit about that? <laughs> there was a big party planned. Lots of eating and drinking. A special audience with the angels. Because the angels, after all, had given Jesus special attention the whole time he was on the earth. And so they got together and they reminisced about those days and they ate and drank. Oh, I said that already. They ate and drank and they had a great party. And then things kind of quieted down and the revelry subsided and the angels got serious. They wanted to know, after all, how it went and what the plan was and one of the angels asked a question, probably a good first question. He said, what was your favorite part about being there on the earth? And Jesus said, you know, probably my two favorite moments were sunrises over the Lake of Galilee and sunsets from the Mount of Olives. Jesus' favorite moments. And then one of the angels said, you know, how did it go? And Jesus held out his hands and kicked up his feet. And I think that was all the answer that needed to be given. And then one of the angels said, and what's your plan now, Jesus? I mean, you kind of just got it started. How's this whole venture going to continue? You're not there anymore. What's going to happen? And Jesus said, remember those disciples? And the angels laughed uproariously. Yeah, <laughs> we remember those disciples. They couldn't even figure out that you could multiply bread. They had no idea that you could raise people from the dead. They thought they were going to get swords and start fighting the Romans, a bunch of fishermen. They were silly. Those disciples? And then they kind of got some sober looks on their face. The disciples? And Jesus said, yeah, the disciples. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Peter, James, and John, and Paul, and Mary. Thank you for laughing. I taught them everything they need to know. I showed them how to include people in this community who were not included. I showed them how to heal, how to bring life where there was death. I showed them how to confront the powers, how to speak truth to those people who want to protect their position. I showed them not to be afraid of death. I showed them that God uses death, overcomes it with life. I showed them everything they need to know. And then I left them the spirit. Jesus said, that's the plan. Yikes. Huh. We are the plan. The followers of Jesus are the plan Jesus left on this earth for finishing the project. I have a good friend who likes to say that Jesus will return the day after Jesus' followers have redeemed the earth. That's going to be a long time. We are plan A, and there is no plan B. So I don't know about you, but when I was growing up in the church, I was taught that the plan of salvation was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, in parentheses, from hell. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. So that's a start of a plan. But if all we ever do is believe... 
I mean, we can sit here and believe, right? If all we ever do is believe, that's only part of a plan. So Richard Mao, who was a professor at Calvin College when I was there and now is president of Fuller Seminary in California, tells this story to illustrate the difference between kind of this personal belief and, and action. He says, there was a scholar who knew everything there was to know about Abraham Lincoln. He could recite all of Abraham's Link Abraham Lincoln's speeches. He could tell you what Abraham Lincoln was thinking at the various stages of his uh, political career. He was the go-to guy if you wanted to know about Abraham Lincoln. But there was a little girl who lived next door to Abraham Lincoln. And every day, when Abraham Lincoln came home, she would run outside. And he would grab her in his arms, and he would give her a hug, and he would whisper a secret in her ear. And sometimes, he would even tell her a story about how his day had gone. Who knew Abraham Lincoln better? I'm sure we all, we'd all say the little girl, right? She knew him personally, right? But now consider this story. There was a newspaper journalist who knew everything there was to know about the local mobster. He knew all his comings and goings. He knew all his arrest record, his rap sheet. He knew the human trafficking. He knew the drug smuggling. He knew the murders. He knew the extortion. He knew it all. But next to the mobster, there lived a little girl. And every day, when the mobster came home, he would grab the little girl up in his arms, and he would give her hugs, and he would tell her a secret, and sometimes he would even tell her a story. Who knew the mobster better? Well, <laughs> the little girl knew the mobster personally. The reporter, maybe not. But if you want to really know the mobster, that's the stuff you got to know. Sometimes knowing someone personally isn't any good if you don't know everything there is to know. The disciples knew everything Jesus thought was important for them to know. I wonder if we do. I wonder if maybe that's why we're safe and comfortable in the pews because we don't know. How would Jesus do this? Or how would Jesus do that? Or what would Jesus do in this situation or that situation? One of the last conversations that Jesus had with his disciples is recorded in the Gospel of John. Jesus told his disciples that he was the door to new life, that he was the gate into the safety of the sheepfold, that he was the bread that satisfied their hunger, that he was the living water, and if they drank of it, they would never thirst again, that he was the way all they needed to do was follow, that he was the truth when it disappeared. And then he told them, I have to go away, but I will send someone. Someone to give you comfort because I'm gone and you'll be sad. Someone to give you courage because when you go, because when you go into the world, because when you face the world, it will be frightening. I will send a spirit to make a community of people 
with whom you can go, on whom you can depend. Those people, you can practice telling your story. You can share your joys and concerns. And you can think about, how does this sound when I tell it? Because the plan really isn't all that difficult. You heard it from Peg. The plan is just to be witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness tells the truth. You see a car accident, you witness to what you saw. You sit in a courtroom, you tell the truth about what you're asked. Witness has gotten a bad rap. You know, it's that proselytizing thing. I gotta go make someone a Christian. That's not what Jesus said. All he said was, witness, tell the truth about me. Tell the truth about how your relationship with Jesus has changed your life. Tell the truth about why you gather in this place on Sunday morning. Why do you sit in, in the pew together? I know it's not to listen to me. It's because you gain something of God's love from being part of this community. It's because you're supported in your attempts to reach out to the least, the last, and lost. You do it together because it's hard to do it alone. All we need to do is witness. You know, if you're anything like me, we haven't practiced this very much. I'm really timid out there. With I don't even want people to know I'm a pastor. All of a sudden, they change their whole demeanor. And when they find out you're a Christian, oh, you're one of those. There are some Christians who aren't those, right? There are some Christians who are welcoming and inclusive people. There are Christians who don't judge, who don't exclude, who are friendly and gracious and forgiving, who repent when they do something wrong. All we have to do is a witness. So, in your bulletin, there's a definition of a Christian. I'd like you to look at the meditation with me. This comes from Samuel Wells, who was dean of Duke University Chapel. Just the first sentence there. He writes, a Christian is a socially deviant, that doesn't sound very good, does it? Socially deviant, politically unreliable. Christian isn't one who votes one way or the other, right? Politically unreliable, worshiper of a god beyond the imagination of the advertisers and social critics. Does that characterize us? Socially deviant, politically unreliable, worshiper of God beyond imagination. Here's another definition that I found that I just think is fascinating. This was written by Thomas Merton in the Seven Story Mountain. <clears throat> he says, although they live in Greek, and oh, by the way, this is from the third century, so you're going to find it a little uh, strange, but I think you'll still get the point. <clears throat> Although they live in Greek and barbarian cities, depending on their place of birth, and follow the usual customs of those cities, they never cease to witness to the reality of another city in which they live. They share in everything as citizens, yet endure everything as aliens. Every foreign land is their father or motherland, and yet for them, every father or motherland is a foreign land. They marry like everyone else, and they beget children, but they do not expose their unwanted infants to the elements. They share their board, 
their homes with each other, but not their marriage beds. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the laws of the land, but their own lives go far beyond the law's requirements. They love all people, and by all people are persecuted. They are put to death, and yet they're brought to life. They're poor, and yet they make many rich. They're completely destitute, and yet they enjoy complete abundance. They're dishonored, and in their dishonor are glorified. They're reviled, and yet they bless. They're treated by the Jews as foreigners. They're hunted by the Greeks. And all the time, those who hate them find it impossible to justify their hatred. To put it simply, what the soul is in the body, that Christians are in the world. These are powerful images of who we are called to be. So what's Jesus doing right now? The Bible tells us that Jesus is waiting. Waiting. We think we're waiting for Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come back, Jesus, quick. This place is a mess. The Bible tells us that Jesus is waiting for us to follow the plan, to do the work of redemption, to move forward into the world using our gifts and strengths as social deviants and politically unreliable, as people who are hated but no one can justify the hatred, as people who behave contrary to the way the world behaves because we're so full of God's love. Jesus is waiting. Amen. Amen.